As business owners, entrepreneurs, family men, it's difficult for us to find the time to put together projects like these. Even though it's something we really want to do, unfortunately, taking care of the things we have to take care of comes first. However, because of viewer support for people like you, we're able to continue doing this. Please consider joining our Patreon and supporting the Burn and Return podcast. Listening to Burn and Return, a weekly one hour podcast covering news from the agricultural and turf grass industries. The DJ Scratch means it is time for another episode of Burn and Return. I want to thank you all for tuning in. My name is Matt. Sometimes I go by the Grass Factor. My last name is Martin. That was a callback. Uh, if you're tuning in for the first time, this is a quasi news podcast where we talk about current events that are influencing things in the green industry, whether they're taking place on a global scale or they're taking place right here in the United States. And boy, oh boy, do we love to get into the meat and potatoes of it. Uh, we have three segments that we call headlines and we have burns then we have returns. Hence the name of the show, burn and return alongside me. We have. Mr. Ray Ito and Mr. Ryan DeMay, gentlemen, how in the hell are y'all doing tonight? Because uh, I am cranked up to about nine, and uh, we're not even at Joe Knows Turf yet. I, I mean, if you missed the pre-show and, and you're not a, if you're not a member, uh, you know, go over there and click www.patreon.com forward slash burn return. You can check it out. But uh, yeah, all the uh, all the talk there about you know primates and penises. King Kong Gums. and Dong, like it, 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 I was educated this evening. I feel better about it now. So <laughs> I'm, I was, I got some news, and now I, I feel like we can move on to the rest of the story. So Ray, how are you this evening? <laughs> I'm good for the moment. I am good. I mean, uh, I guess I'm my usual self. So uh, for better or worse, right, Matt? <laughs> Ray, uh, I hope you're ready and buckled in because um, it, this <laughs> this episode of Joe Knows Turf is going to be a real doozy, and we got one in the headline here uh, that is that is going to be really exciting too. And I I did one of those things where I read it in the headline and then I went way over the top trying to figure out um, uh, the 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 details of it. And so anyway, I can't wait to look. I can't wait to get into it. So let's go ahead and jump into this week's snurfing. Uh, headlines. Snurfing. Instead of smurfing. That's how serious I am. Unmute yourself. This is, just the news. <laughs> uh, this is just the news, and there is nothing to fear here. Um, but this is what... Well, maybe. Maybe I was being a little facetious there. Uh, we have been talking about PFAS in sewage sludge here for a little bit because it's in the news... And again, and I'll, I'll repeat this like I said previously, when it when it was first in the news, you would see it once a quarter. And then all of a sudden you'd see it once a month. Now we see it every week and multiple times a week uh, for for uh, to, you know, to show the increasing amount of, of realization or uh, highlighting that's taken place on PFAS and sewage sludge. And so because. That is something that we as turf applicators, whether you're in sports turf, golf turf, or uh, or lawn care, it don't matter. Guarantee you, you have gone to a distributor and you have bought a bag of fertilizer that's got biosolids in it. And that is exactly, particularly, what we're talking about here. And uh, this first headline here says, sludge containing forever chemicals spread on Illinois farmland. Uh, farmer Ray Deadmering checks his soybean field uh, it gets sludge. It gets free sludge from the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District to fertilize his field. So he's all over it, right? He didn't think twice after a salesman knocked on his door a decade ago and offered Will County farmers as much free fertilizer as he wanted. Instead of paying for nitrogen and other crop stimulating nutrients, uh, Dent Marine, uh began welcoming truckloads of sewage sludge, a byproduct of human industrial waste from Chicago and the Cook County suburbs. 
It might not smell that great. You don't get something for nothing very often, though. Dozens of other farmers on the edge of suburbia were doing the same thing. They're encouraged to spread sludge on their fields by local officials, farm bureaus, university extension agents, and even the U.S. EPA. But despite assurances the practice is safe and legal, sewer sludge is contaminating thousands of acres of northeast Illinois farmland with toxic forever chemicals. Uh, forever chemicals known as PFAS, blah, 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 blah. And uh, so anyway, the, uh, the, and you can go into it here, and the, the, the article actually does a pretty good job of trying to uh, play both sides of the aisle here. And, uh, and that's not what I'm here to do. I'm here to point you to be able to go look at this and read into it, but more so what I want to do is talk about how um, I'm curious from Ray and Ryan or biosolids, you know, I, it hasn't quite gone out yet. I'd say over the next month, we're going to start getting our early order program uh, 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 purchase contracts from all the different manufacturers, blenders, suppliers, distributors, and all that fine stuff. Um, are you hearing anything on your side specific to biosolids and biosolid availability going into uh, this season? And I will preface that by saying is that I'm not hearing anything related to limited biosolid availability going into this. Absolutely nothing. And I've even asked the question, too, of, you know, have you seen the reports? Have you seen this? Have you seen that? Not trying to be a nervous Nelly, but to, you know, again, to point out that there's starting to be, you know, this wave out there uh, around the country that, hey, are you using these things, right? And nobody, I don't think, as far as, you know, applicators go or, uh, lawn care operators go, you know, nobody wants to get caught flat-footed on that question. Hey, are you using these? And either you don't know or you have to say, yeah, we are. And then who really knows what's in them, right? You know, because, again, uh, well, Matt, I'm going to ask you a question back. Let's just take a big-time distributor, and we won't name names, but any big-time distributor, how many different sources of biosolids could they be pulling from within a given region, say the Midwest, the Southeast, something like that, or even nationwide, is it a half a dozen? Is it one? Is it 20? I mean, what do you think? I would say there's going to be a hundred wastewater treatment facilities that are offering biosolids right now that could qualify as class A exceptional quality biosolids. So basically, and hang on, before you get real fired up and here, class A exceptional quality, meaning that you know these things are just like the cleanest of the clean biosolids, Really, what that boils down to is granulation characteristics uh, and uh, and and mm. ability to be blended. So, particle size distribution, crush strength, uh, moisture content falls within an acceptable level of risk. And then, typically, they will do a bacteria uh, load on it to make sure it's not full of salmonella or E. coli before they send it out. Right. So that is pretty much what classifies a class a exceptional quality biosolid and i'm going to guess that there's probably a hundred places that's coming from right now and that's a Jeez. guess it could be it could be 75. right sure. so then tracking well, that tracking that back ray i mean mm -hmm. I, i'm sure that the loads are different based on the location and what kind of industry and everything else is around these areas right so you know am i getting the the top shelf PFOS or am I getting the well liquor PFOS? You know, I want to know what I, I want to know what I got here. Yeah, well, and on my end, to answer Matt's question, I specifically advertise that at no time do I apply biosolids, manure, or compost to a lawn or landscape. I advertise that. Got to differentiate. And I'll, you know? and, and I'll, and I'll, I'll play, I'll play both sides of that out here. And I'll say there's, I have no problem that if people choose to apply it. However, what I do think is that as applicators, what we should be doing is asking the question from our suppliers. Can you show me that I do not have a risk of PFAS in my biosolid product that I'm spreading across thousands of acres this year or hundreds of acres, however many, you know, and, and, and to put it and to put this into perspective, right. And I, I think this is something that a lot of homeowners that are listening may not understand a solo lawn care operator guy is probably going to manage somewhere around 200 acres by himself. Uh, and, and that is, you think about that, you got 200 acres, you're doing seven visits a year, five of those are fertility. That is, that is a thousand acres of, fertilization that's taking place in a given year 
So the potential for a metric fuck shit ton of voodoo ton of uh, bios. I'm already cussing six minutes into the podcast. That's a that's a very high probability of of a lot of of PFAS contaminated biosolids having the opportunity to go down. But we just don't know, right? And it's in there's two ways to approach this, right? Wait until you're told about it, or get out ahead of it and do something, right? And uh, and you can make adjustments if you do find out, or whatever the case may be. And so it's a it's an icky, sticky gray area, gray water area. If you're being punny, and uh, and you know, I I in my opinion, in my opinion, and Ray and Ryan, I want to ask you all this too: Is this something applicators should be demanding of their distributors? I don't know if you need to demand it. I just think you and demand cut out. I cut out. Okay. I know. Uh, do, uh, well, yeah, you, you cut out. Go ahead, though. I'm Repeat sorry. Yourself. No, what I was, sorry. What I was going to say is that uh, just like a lot of times, we haven't talked about this in a while, right? Since all the fertilizer hubbub here, you know, four, five, six months ago. But uh, you ought to know what you're using, right? Like you should be a choosy. What, what, what's? Uh, I think Matt, you've said this before, and Ray has echoed these same sentiments. Is that the minute that you know you're a true professional? Right in this business is when you can walk in there and say, "This is what I need. What's the price?" Instead of saying, "Hey, man, what do you think I should do?" Oh man, check this out. Is I got that... you some nice. I got you some XCU, a little bit of urea and some mop, all cut down with this, you know, four four zero bio solid stuff. Go ahead. You know, <laughs> there's no f- there, there's yep. no filler in that bag. There's no filler. Go for it. Right, and well, that's mm-hmm. then you're rolling the dice. Right, you've taken. A certain amount of control out of your hands and so i guess that's the, that's the thing is like just to have the control and know what you're using and execute what you need to do and not what somebody else tells you that you need to do that's the difference and that's where you got to get to and this is a great a great way it should be a great motivation to work towards that end well it's only uh, going to get worse you know, yeah because the funny funny thing you should mention that is because I am known as kind of the control freak regarding what gets applied to a client's lawn and landscape. And on the chopping block or rejection list, items include biosolids, compost, uh, and then lastly, of course, is potassium chloride, you know, for example. And my supplier's know that i'm like that okay they know and that is with either trepidation or a sales opportunity for them because they know that i am not going to be ordering a bag of the cheap shit pun intended there (laughs) listen listen how many people do you think between matt ray and myself at every site one Helena and every other place around when we walked in we're like oh god this fucking dick bag again do you know <laughs> how many people I could not buy from anymore because that was exactly how they talked about me when I walked in I was or- down to one last <laughs> distributor one last distributor would sell to and that's me why- in Knoxville and- and that's why he started making his own fertilizer, ladies and gentlemen. You heard it. You're here. not wrong. That was the whole motivation, Demay. That was the whole motivation. <laughs> Sitting down with John Borden, talking over a damn uh, uh, beer on a rainy October afternoon, plotting out our fertilizer plant on a napkin. My whole motivation was to have something that I could go apply on lawns that I didn't have to worry about someone cramming a bottle of Outrider down my throat when I didn't ask for ri- Outrider. <laughs> I came in here and I asked what I wanted for it. I don't need your suggestions of of whatever it is. If I want it, I'll ask for it. You don't have to tell me to get it. I'm, look at look at me. I'm so cranked up on this next episode on this uh, next article here already <laughs> that I'm screaming at you about something that happened, you know, seven years ago, six years ago. And then it doesn't make any sense. Um, okay, so I'm going to try and look at this in the most objective way possible. And, this, and the, the article here is 
A new study shows that commonly used herbicide crosses the blood-brain barrier, and this is out of uh, Arizona State. And um, in the particular uh, herbicide du jour here is none other than our favorite glyphosate. And specifically what they looked at here, and I'll just read from it, uh, glyphosate is a widely used herbicide spread in a variety of crops worldwide. A new study explores the possible effects of brain uh, to the brain of glyphosate exposure. The herbicide is shown to cross the blood-brain barrier and may be correlated with hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. Hang on. Let me reread this line real quick. The herbicide is shown to cross the blood-brain barrier and may be correlated with hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. So we got that piece. Now let's kind of unpiece why they're saying that it may uh, uh, correlate with hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. The research demonstrates for the first time that glyphosate, glyphosate successfully crosses the blood brain, ba- brain barrier and infiltrates the brain. Once there, it acts to enhance levels of a critical factor known as TNFA. TNFA is a molecule with two faces. This pro inflammatory cytokine performs vital functions in the neuroimmune system, acting to enhance immune response to protect the brain. When levels of TNFA are dysregulated, however, a host of diseases linked with neuroinflammation can result. Among these is Alzheimer's disease. The study further demonstrates in cell culture studies that glyphosate exposure appears to increase the production of soluble beta amyloid and reduce the viability of neurons. The accumulation of soluble beta amyloid, the sticky protein responsible for the formation of soluble beta amyloid plaques, is one of the central diagnostic hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. Further evidence suggests, uh, suggested a potential hazards to neurological health were observed when the researchers examined changes in gene expression via an RNA sequencing brain of mice following glyphosate exposure. These RNA transcripts hinted at disruptions in the expression of genes related to neurodegenerative diseases, including dysregulation of a class of brain cells responsible for producing the myelin uh, sheath critical for proper neuronal communication. These cells, known as oligodendrocytes, are affected by elevated levels of TNFA. Uh, we find increases of TNFA in the brain following glyphosate exposure, said Velasquez, the senior author of the paper. While we examine Alzheimer's disease pathology, this might have implications for many neuro- neuro- de- neurodegenerative diseases, given that neuroinflammation is seen in a variety of brain disorders. Uh, and so it goes on here, and uh, and you know, I, I, lo- I love this right here. Toxic effects, the jury is still out. Uh, the new study examines the neurological effects of glyphosate, the most ubiquitous herbicide in global use. Uh, studies of acute herbicide use suggest they're not harmful, but little is known about possible long-term effects of prolonged exposure. Uh, one issue considered uh, considerable concern is that glyphosate can cross the blood-brain barrier, a layer of endo, uh, endothelial cells preventing dissolved substances and circulating bloodstream from readily passing into the extracellular fluid of the central nervous system where the brain, uh, brain's neurons uh, aside. Potential risk to brain health posed by glyphosate should be critically evaluated, particularly for those consistently exposed to the herbicide. Okay, so now we're going to get into kind of the meat and the potatoes of it here. Uh, and I'm going to, let me let me get to the screen here so I can tell uh, JPink which link to open first. Um, the first one we are going to look at, well, actually, I don't think I have that link in here. Here, I'm going to send this to, uh, to JPink. And that way we can at least put this into the notes, but this is the actual study that took place. And, um, and a a couple of things to note here is that the, um, they were forcing this on uh, mice via, via oral consumption, and they were dosing it at uh, 125 milligrams per kilogram, uh, 250 milligrams per kilogram and 500 milligrams per kilogram. And where you started getting into the statistical significance of, uh, of heightened, um, uh, uh, a, a B's amyloid B's and, uh, the TNFAs, um, is it, 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 it is there at a hundred, uh, milligrams per kilogram at 125 milligrams per kilogram per day. But you kind of have an exponential increase as you move to 250 and 500. And so to put that into perspective with humans, that would be consuming if you're a 200 pound man, uh, 12.8 ounces, uh, per day. Uh, for 14 consecutive days. Um, and that would range. So 2.56 ounces to 12.8 ounces per 200 pound man per day for 14 days. If you were completely apples to apples with the, um, uh, the, the study that was performed on mice. Okay. Now there's a couple of other things here. Um, and part of, part of that, that we, we also want to talk about is that, uh, I'm going to skip this first link JPing, and I'm going to go to the second one is 
What we have also discovered is that there are a fair number of foods that are going to increase amyloid B plaques, right? So we see that study immediately. We're starting to get freaked out because, holy shit, glyphosate's increasing uh, AB plaques uh, and TNFAs in the brain. We're screwed. This is what we were all here for. Well, guess what? Uh, So does processed meats. Uh, poultry, takeaway foods, fried fish, other fish, fried potatoes, other potatoes, yellow or red vegetables, legumes, cruciferous vegetables, leafy green vegetables, other vegetables, tomatoes, fresh fruit, canned fruit, uh, cakes, biscuits, sweet pastries, low-fat dairy products, full-fat dairy products, soy milk, confectionery, added sugar, potato chips, nuts, eggs, fruit juice, saturated spreads, unsaturated spreads, beer, wine, uh, spirits, whole grains, refined grains, red meat. So you're not escaping anything through the course of your day that is not going to have the potential to increase AB plaques in your brain. Okay, we're going to take it one step further here. Um, If anybody has ever had a night of sleep deprivation, one night of sleep deprivation will increase AB by 17% in healthy adults. 17%. One night of sleep deprivation. Imagine what happens when you have a newborn and you're also cranking out uh, four-hour nights of sleep, maybe, uh, over the course of three years. Wait, that's okay. just the end now of we're gonna go. Years? Yeah, well, I was, I was going to give it a solid three seconds to just let that sink in for everyone that has been through that. Uh, now, we're also going to talk about uh, glucocorticos, uh, corticoids. Uh, If anybody that is on a long-term asthma medication, a lot of times you're going to see glucocorticoids uh, prescribed for this. For instance, my wife is on a glucocorticoid. Um, They increase amyloid Bs by a very significant amount and almost an identical uh, test methodology that was performed with glyphosate here. So, Again, I, I firmly believe this is something that we should pay attention to. Considerable more testing should be done to replicate this. I'm not throwing shade on Arizona State and saying that what they're doing is bullshit. What I am saying, though, is that, okay, we've got one study as a starting point. Now let's build upon it, and let's start taking different variables into account and see what, what ends up happening. Because um, you know we have a hypothesis now, and uh, you know, via our scientific method, let's deduce it and break it down and figure out everything we possibly can about it. And I and I and I hope, I hope for Christ's sake that we actually do do this to the absolute best of our ability because it is very important. Um, oh, what is this that you just? Now wait, now now listen. I, okay. I want to say two okay. things. Okay. I want to say, was this part of what you wanted to say? No, I have no idea this? what this is. I just saw okay. the headline there, and and I and I got all right. Sidetracked. So so okay, you take so over he, from so, this point. So for a couple of things uh, out of that list that you mentioned, uh, what I what I surmise from that list of things is that I'm going to have to live on a steady diet of uh, warm bowls of that movie theater butter and eating it with a spoon. I think that was the only thing that wasn't listed on that list of foods that we should be safe. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with that as my diet. Uh, all liquid, you know, should pass through everything just fine. Uh, so, okay. Uh, the, wait a the, second. Wait a second. Would that be considered a melted, saturated spread? I, you know, is it a spread? Do you, you don't spread butter on popcorn. If it solidifies, so I'm just gonna say, if it solidifies, if you cool it and on. it congeals, is that is that is that a saturated spread or an unsaturated I don't think, spread? I don't. Th- I don't think you can cool that stuff down. I'm pretty sure it's a liquid actually, or whatever temperature. Actually, uh, I'll tell you what that stuff is. Uh, that stuff that they put on movie it's theater always hot. Pop- you don't even have to heat popcorn it. Popcorn is horrific, and I'll tell you why it's horrific. It what? is amyloid B plaque. <laughs> no, because that shit is butter flavored soybean oil. That's what hey. they put on popcorn, and All right. that that is why when I want popcorn. I'm going to pop it myself and melt actual butter to toss the popcorn in. Well, Thank Ray's you. going to get Alzheimer's. <laughs> uh, g- g- talk about this to me <laughs> okay. because I have okay. read this article and it's fascinating. And I've got a little side story about it too. So go ahead. All right. So, you know, it's fairly recent here that uh, there's been some, call- some uh, questioning on the research that was done into the amyloid beta plaque being sort of the underpinning of how Alzheimer's affects people's brain, right? 
Before that, they didn't really know. And then this study came out in 2006 uh, out of the University of Minnesota and some researchers there. And what folks are saying now here, you know, some 16 years later, is that a lot of the evidence in that case, a lot of the imaging that they took of, uh, of brains to show, you know, this plaque buildups and how it affected Alzheimer patients and some of the data that came back behind it as well was fabricated, that it was not 100% real. And all, or not all, but a significant portion of the research ever since and a significant portion of the pharmaceutical industry drug development has been centered around this idea that we're trying to prevent uh, these amyloid beta plaques, right? And so that's why when you look at this and say, okay, hey, well, it, it's Alzheimer's likes, but, but is this, you know, a, an issue, right, within the brain? And is this something that, I, I don't know, I'm not trying to discredit the ASG research. I think you got to be mindful of it. But again, to say that this is bad, Right, right off the bat, without a whole lot of uh, relevant knowledge, that it, it would seem like, right, that we should be able to study this pretty readily because, you know, they talk about its ubiquitous use. They talk about how it's used all over the world. It's used in, you know, all these different crops, things like that. We should be able to take workers out of that scenario, right? And let's just say for the fact that, again, that the amounts that, you know, they were having uh, their subject rats and mice ingest were off the charts high like it wouldn't happen in a work type setting right and it certainly wouldn't happen in a consumption setting when we're talking about you know pesticide residues and things like that so imagine that putting say, two ounces of soap on your hand and having to wash it off and we'll say that you have a transdermal absorption uh, capacity of 10 percent right uh, and that and that would be highly dependent upon the carrier that you use to facilitate, you know, uh, dermal absorption, right? So you would effectively, if if you need to get two and a half ounces into you, you would have to have your hands dipped in or have rubbed all over your body twenty five ounces for dermal absorption, right? Because if you just put like twenty five ounces and dipped your hand in it, you're not going to absorb two and a half ounces through your hands. It has to be spread Listen. out over over a larger surface area, right? So, I, and I just want to say that to point, paint the picture that it is very difficult to ingest two and a half ounces of glyphosate a day. You would have no. It wasn't it twelve ounces was what you came up with but, on the uh, yeah two two twelve and a half to, to twelve point eight ounces. Were, were that was that was the range. Tested. You'd have and, to do a boiler. You have to do a boiler maker, Ray, every day. You'd have to shotgun an entire beer. Of Roundup, <laughs> and then you'd have to take a shot of Roundup to follow that and chase okay. that down. And you know what? That is logistically impossible because for one thing, <laughs> for a lot of reasons, for a lot of fucking for reasons, many, <laughs> it's logistically for many freaking, impossible. No, for many freaking reasons. You see, do you know what burns my ass about all of these studies? <laughs> is this wait, barrel wait, pick wait, Roundup? Wait. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What burns my ass about these studies is that Penny Roundup beers. They, yeah, they never match actual conditions. <laughs> this is technical grade glyphosate without the accompanying surfactants essentially being injected into the stomachs of these animals. That is just not realistic okay that's not realistic. yeah it was an oral garbage yeah hey, but, yeah but, and and the thing is is that the reason why i bring this up is because the surfactants that are co-packaged with glyphosate if you were to give somebody two and a half ounces of glyphosate orally the first thing that would happen is they would have corrosive burns to their throat and digestive tract that's the first effect. Never mind what happens to their brain. So this is not the, realistic. <laughs> so the, the Alzheimer is a, is of particular interest to me because the majority of the men on my mom's side of the family died of either suicide or Alzheimer's. Not really a whole lot of in betweens. And uh, mm -hmm. and I got sucked into this. There was a drug that was in phase two B clinical trials, uh, and the active ingredient was bri uh, bryostatin. And uh, it was by a, a, uh, a biotech company called Neurotrope. And they had this, um, 
uh, Dr. Alkin was the one who was putting out all this all this information. And it was funny because uh, right as it went into uh, phase two B trials, uh, there of of course was a Wall Street bets post on Reddit, and it was one of the best due diligence posts that you know back when Wall Street bets used to do due diligence posts. Uh, that was it was called Alkin the Falcon, a tale of big brains and fifty thousand percent gains. And, uh, and it was a really deep dive into the company, into the doctor who researched it, into Bravstat and one, and the, uh, the ability to re- reduce AV plaques in the brain, right? And of course, um, what we've come to find out is that there are lots of effective drugs at reducing AV plaques in the brain. However, they're not all effective at reducing uh, the severity of Alzheimer's, and they're, none of them are effective at curing it or uh, offering any, any real major benefit there. So... Um, it's 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 interesting. It's fascinating, and I definitely think this is something that, as an industry, or something that that we, uh, uh, particularly as a, as a voice for the industry, should keep our eye on, and I continue to pay attention to, to research that comes out of it. Now, I will say this: is that of the years I've been doing this, and the amount of deep dives that I I, I tend to do through the course of the year, um, uh, glyphosate linkage or correlation with Alzheimer's is brand new to me. I have I have never heard that before. And uh, and it's interesting that it's showing up now, uh, especially with this uh, science.org article that uh, that uh, uh, DeMay brought to us here. And I've just begun to unpack that. I, I came across it the other day and it's, it's pretty fascinating about, um, you know, it turns out AB plaques and all this and how we understand Alzheimer's that's for at least information that's been related to the public may not be accurate at all, uh, or at least uh, it, it may not be as accurate as we thought it was. So. Anyway, we will continue to keep you up to date on this because I promise you, if there's anybody that wants to stay ahead of the curve on this, we will continue to beat your beat your brains in about PFAS and biosolids. We will continue to, to beat your brains in about biochar scams. We will continue to beat your brains in about Sri Lanka and the other shit that we've gotten out way ahead of because uh, because we give a shit. And uh, and so that's that's what we're here for and that's what we're going to do. But that is going to be our headlines because... <laughs> Boys, it's time to do ke- oh, it's time to do keg stands with the roundup tote. Oh no, it's time yes. for Jono's turf. Jono's <laughs> <laughs> turf. Hi, I'm Joe. I'm gonna give you a bunch of accurate turf facts today because Joe knows turf. <laughs> hey, J Pink, do you think at Cotton Eye Joe in Knoxville they will do uh, penny uh, penny glyphosate beers over there? Hey, hey, <laughs> uh, actually, let's check in with John Perry. John Perry, would you recommend going to Cotton Eye Joe? Period. I would advise anybody who's thinking of doing this not. Oh, I agree. Joe, it's got some, but it, if it's, you it's, did it's go, got some good guru reviews, you know, it's got some good guru it, reviews. It does, and if you know, if you're into the meth chicks, yeah, I mean, there's there are a dime a dozen there. Uh, <laughs> they're they're a penny. They're a penny a dozen there. Um, and uh, uh, with inflation, would you rec- would you recommend drinking penny beers or penny roundup beers at Cotton Eye Joe? I would <laughs> advise anybody who's thinking of doing this not. <laughs> See, that is a sign of good faith. The John voice of reason. Are in perfect, voice of perfect reason here. Harmony there on the, on the same page. Can't Talk wait to see you in Louisville, John. This week. Well, <laughs> boys, it's an extra special double feature. And the first one. A twofer. Us, I th- it's a twofer. Uh, the first one that we're going to do uh, was was subject to a, a, a TikTok or a, a, I don't know if it, where, what other social media platforms that ended up on. But Matt has been waiting, oh, about... 55 hours, 48 minutes, and 13 seconds. <laughs> He's had this one circled on the calendar. He set multiple alarms. It says every time the alarm goes off, David Goggins comes on there and screams and yells at him, and his alarm <laughs> says, get pissed off about Jono's turf again. So he has been uh, foaming <laughs> at the mouth. And, Ray, I don't think you're going to like this one either. It uh, uh, th- There's a lot that you shouldn't be doing, and... Uh, Let's just go ahead and watch this one from uh, a, a previous uh, entrant in here. Not into the it was pre Jono's turf, but uh, uh, if you'll remember the episode entitled "Pesty My Testies," here comes Pesty. Oh God! Oh no! Not this guy! Oop. Not this guy! Not this Oop. guy! Oop. Other guy! Other there guy! One. Other guy! Other guy! 
<laughs> oh, now we got all the buttons going. <laughs> Sorry. This is J-Ping, the other guy, we, the video. Did we send you the other one? Oh, yeah, we did. We did. It's going to be, uh, yeah, yeah. Here he goes. Here we go. All right, we're good. Here we go. All right, guys. I want to get a jump on the bugs before summertime gets into full swing. And I want a more DIY option. Thankfully, Festy reached out and asked if I'd give their program a try. It's way more affordable, and they still customize everything based on the season and the bugs creeping around your area. Oh, for Christ's sake, he's, he's, he's not direct- filling that in, in his kitchen. Pause. He's not Pause. filling that in his kitchen. My to God. be fair, we don't know. We don't know that this is his house or his kitchen. It could be the kitchen of one of his mortal em- enemies. You know, I mean, maybe that's just where he decided to mix it up. I don't know, right? Wh- oh because, because you know, why I say that though, Ray? Because, because nobody could be this dense as to mix up EPA registered insecticides in their own kitchen on the counter, right there by the kitchen sink. I mean, and- nobody could possibly do that, right? And, and one more thing, uh, dude, cool shirt, cool shoes, but then, you know, almost every structural insecticide that I'm familiar with calls for long pants, long sleeves, and gloves. However, I think we talked about this before, mm. Not, not the gloves that... Uh, the doctor uses before giving you a prostate exam. Correct. Do you, so, let me ask <laughs> this. Do you think they sent those gloves as part of their PPE I hope package? To, I hope to hell not. I bet. I bet. I really. Do. I'd bet $100 that's what they sent. I hope not. I wouldn't bet $100. Either, because... I, I'll, I'll bet 10 Let's go. Hang on. Let's bet All for right, my 10. own pocketbook here. I'll bet 10 bucks. T- 10 bucks. I, I get 10 bucks. you know, uh, in Louisville. We'll find out. We'll, I'll write to Pesty and find out if they send me uh, the squat and cough gloves or if I have to provide those on my own. <laughs> so, my first application is a combo. Pause. Now, pause, pause, pause. There's one other thing I want, I'd want. i like to make mention of. JPen, can you slide back once, uh, just a couple of seconds? Right there, here. So, a fraction of the price, there's an, the next line that has the text over here. It's way I think more it says affordable. this. And they still customize everything based on. Keep going. The season going. and the bugs creeping around your area. They use professional products direct from the manufacturer. All right, so there we go. They use the same active ingredients as the pros do. So to raise point, this is to to bolster your point, Ray, that this isn't like the natural. Uh, what was that company out of California, Matt, that got busted putting all the permethrin and everything else in there? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. yeah uh, the the eco, permethrin eco and carbo- eco, eco, Yeah. The yeah, permethrin. Car- the, the permethrin carbaryl and. Glyphosate uh, cock- cocktail sold as it. Here's what an organic cocktail. pesticide. <laughs> now, now this, now this isn't that. This isn't that. This, yeah. yeah. This, um, so these guys are above board. They're above above board and saying, "Hey, this is the same stuff the pros use." Now you could use this, but in a lot of states, if you're not spraying on your own property, you have to be licensed. And so again, I I I just be awful cautious with this so let's see where he goes with this after mixing up in the kitchen with the wrong gloves and i do want to highlight one other thing on the gloves the reason that we don't use these gloves ray right is because Mm -hmm. what is the most dangerous time in any pesticide application mixing and loading right mixing and and loading yep and so we're doing that right here in the kitchen you know so we have concentrated material right Mm -hmm. there and now if that were to pass through those gloves, now it's literally being held right up against your skin, whether it's on the back of your hand or the palm of your hand, right? And being just held there in place as a concentrated pesticide. Not a good scenario. A, a really, really high risk of dermal exposure in that case. Even if it's for a short-lived time, not a good idea to handle with these. Use the big nitrile mixing gloves, right? That uh, you can Absolutely. get onla- online. You can get them on Amazon, do my own whoever we get nothing back for this other than we just don't want you to have you know any cooties hey, in your hands you know you know keep those you know, Ryan, keep those fingers for what even, you what you brought them for i even see those thick nitro gloves sold at home depot next to the paint there and you they're go. advertised as solvent and chemical resistant gloves and they're equivalent to the chem resistant gloves that i can get from a uh, safety product supplier okay they are of equivalent thickness and so i don't see the need for the uh, rectal exam gloves 
All right, really. so let's, let's, <laughs> first, my first application is a combo that works against a range of nasty bugs. Mosquitoes, ticks, termites, ants, spiders, fleas, and a ton more. Best of all, everything is pre-measured for each application, so you just add water, Jeez. mix, and spray. You're done in minutes. Let it dry before the kids and pets go back out to play. Then, when you're due for another application, they ship it right to your front door automatically. Pesty makes it super simple, and that's what I'll be using to stay bug-free this year. Check them out. This is what happens when VC money moves in to best in affiliate marketing, turf, 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 turf and it's ornamental. Yeah, affiliate marketing, uh, uh, TNO, PNO. It is, they could give a shit about the nuance. They could give a shit about people that do this for a living. The only thing they care about is how are we going to maximize our engagements and whatever the case may be. And how do you do that? You have. You have a, a nice house. You have a nice, clean-looking family. You have a child running around in the video. You have a nice-looking kitchen, and you're mixing pesticide concentrates on your fucking kitchen counter. Yeah. Things Ready? that average, ordinary people do that have pest control services, now all of a sudden you can bring it into your fucking living room, mix it up, and let it go. Because you know what? What it matters to them is that they've got a hundred thousand dollar ad campaign riding on it, and they have to generate five hundred thousand dollars in sales to queue up the next hundred thousand dollar ad campaign they're going to run, right? And so they could give a shit about who gets hurt, what happens, anything of the sort beyond getting that motherfucking ROI, so they can send up another one. Spin it up, boys. We did good there. Let's make some tweaks. This time, instead of mixing on the kitchen counter, we're going to have our wife stand underneath it with her mouth open like she's getting ready to catch it on her face while we mix it right above her and shake it, okay? Because that's what guys are really going for. That's the alpha. That's how we're going to target the alpha male crowd is by having a, a busty woman with her. with her. Again, this so is so... Hey, so it's a weird spot to have a domination line, Matt. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> I thought they called that a landing strip. I don't know. Maybe I, it's different. You. different. Those, are, those, different those aren't tears on her. Those aren't tears on her belly, Matt. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's that's the tempered uh, dripping. And by the way, that's the bottle that that guy opened. And just so that everybody knows, tempered is a combination of cyflucerin and imidacloprid and let's just say that cyflucerin is not something that i want on my skin or anywhere where i'm going to have food or drinks i mean or that stuff my, is just no no way on my okay. ankles or on my ankles yeah. as i spray or my shoes that i'll wear back in the house i mean I, I'm just, yeah it's the, it's the stuff <laughs> like that like Here's and I think we said this before when Pesty was on here. Like, you know, this guy, I'm not here to rag on him other than he made some poor choices and he could do better. And I think if mm -hmm. he watched this, he would say, "Hey, I know I can do better." Fine, no Did problem. Did you say my temperant is cyflutherin? Yeah, beta cyflutherin. Beta cyflutherin. As, as in tempo. As in tempo, sir. As in tempo, oh, Matt. My <laughs> God, you sure uh, as shit. Do not, if anybody out there that does not know, just do me one favor. Do me one favor. Mix up your tree shrub tank with a label rate of tempo and go spray mm -hmm. Bradford pears, whatever it is, crepe myrtles, pick your poison, go spray them at the appropriate time of the year. Make sure you're spraying over your head and just let a drop or two fall on your scalp. And when it sets on so much fire that you are convinced that you have a hive of fire ants living on your scalp, <laughs> and then by the time you get it washed off and home, that you are glowing like a tomato, please write into me and tell me about how much you enjoyed that experience. Oh, Meanwhile, and by the way, <laughs> go ahead, Matt. And Matt, the other pyrethroids I know that will do things like that include Demand CS mm. and also uh cypermethrin mm. and by fin and by fentrin i mean those mm. are all just something else should you ever absorb it through your skin i mean never mind if you inhale it i mean one of those is just not a good day at all so 
I'm just well, saying. Real, <laughs> real quick, real quick, I because I I want I'm 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 in on this company of of I'm gonna say that they're it's deceptive, and I'll I'll show you why here in a second. Um, J Pink, go ahead and throw this up real quick. Because this is the kind of copy that's on their website. And while it's true, it paints a picture that, yeah, if you want to go out there in your shorts, you know, while your kids are playing on the front and you're out there spraying the back, it's fine. So for the folks that are on audio only, it says, no sketchy chemicals designed for people, pets, and the planet. You shouldn't have to declare nuclear war on your home to get rid of pests. Every pesticide that we send can ha can be used around people and pets. They're even used in hospitals, nursing homes, and pet kennels. Each shipment includes instructions on how to help protect By bees in the environment. With Pesty, you're in control. You always know exactly what you sprayed and where you sprayed at. Okay. There's several things of oh. bullshit in there. Matt made a great point here. All those places, without question, none of them are using Pesty, right? They're being they're being uh, applied by trained people and or licensed people, right? And so licensed uh, people, my, licensed operators. Absolutely. This was my Brian. thing <laughs> to round to round out this one as we move on to our next one is this is that there are a hell of a lot more uh, profitable and better ways to save a hundred or two hundred dollars on your overall home budget for the year. Hire a qualified professional to take care of and handle this stuff, right? Going around your home and doing the right things. And also looking out and saying, hey, man, like, you know, you got a bunch of mulch built up around the house. That's why the ants are getting in. Pull the mulch back. Like, just simple shit like that. If you don't know that and you're just out there spraying, 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 and nothing happens, well, there's other things, too, besides chemical control of these insects. And so, Pesty, sorry, eat shit. All right, next yeah. one. Let's go <laughs> to the main event, Matt. <laughs> Ray, it's time oh. for dessert. It's time for dessert. Now, Matt, oh. beforehand, Matt knew he was going to have dessert, so Matt actually has uh, both bags filled up on his insulin pump, and the dial is turned to 11, ladies and gentlemen. So let's <laughs> dig in and see what this dessert has to offer for us. All right. Thank you to the patron that, that sent this to me, by the way. Who is this guy? Can you tell I, me a little bit about him? Yeah, this is Dr. Jeff right here okay and dr jeff is a world renowned doctor and you may be asking yourself what does a doctor know about agriculture well the truth is is that dr jeff here has unpacked everything there is to know about agriculture and has dumbed it down for everybody because we're all too fucking stupid to understand and uh and and he is going to put it all out right here for us on why he figured out the solution to agriculture, to lawn care, to, to, to anything that involves growing a plant. And what we have been doing up to this point is pure communist garbage. Do you know that nearly 100% of fertilizer, I'm talking about the synthetic kind of fertilizer, you know, the kind that you put on your lawn, your gardens, and for farmers out there, the kind you put on your farms. I'm talking about nearly 100% of the synthetic fertilizer, right, that is used in this country is from two other countries. It's 2022. Can you guess which countries those are? Pause. All right. Most that Trinidad and Tobago. Oh, that's actually. Oh wait, one wait, 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 wait. Let him say which two countries. Most fertilizer is made from natural gas, basically petroleum products, and the top two countries where over 90 percent of it is made and distributed is from China and Russia. Okay, uh, that that is a flat out fucking lie. Uh, yeah. Just a flat out lie. We can over manufacture. The United States is perfectly capable of feeding its own supply if we wanted to. And we could overproduce uh, by a pretty significant amount all the fertilizer that we can consume in this country. We do import some of it. Why? Because sometimes we can get it cheaper overseas and we can get it manufactured in house. Pretty much the majority of ag fertilizers that are going down to the United States are produced in the United States, um, especially as you start moving into specialty ag so uh, or vegetable growing and especially in turf and ornamental, right? 
you're going to get some weird things coming out of some local co-ops. And especially now that you've started seeing some monopolization of co-ops with Winfield Solutions and Pinnacle Ag, and you're going to see some, some Russian UAN coming out of Simplot and things like that. No harm, no foul. But in terms of what our overall import levels of like urea is, for instance, we're only getting 6% of it from Russia, I think was the, the latest updated statistic as of prior to the Ukrainian war was 6%. So first off, the, the, the main point that has come out of this guy's mouth, that 90 plus percent, the majority of the fertilizer that we use in the United States that we're spreading in the United States is coming from Russia or China is a fucking lie. All right, we'll go ahead. And I'm not kidding when I say that. China and Russia are the biggest exporters of synthetic fertilizer, the kind we use in this country. So we're already starting to feel a problem in the United States with we're just starting to run out of product, right? And fertilizer is one of those. And fertilizer okay, pause. is what basically makes... No, we're not just simply running out of it. We ran into one of the greatest supply chain issues in the entire fucking world, in the history of the world, due to a series of crazy, crazy, who knows what the hell to do events that related to a damn pandemic and people who just completely freaked the fuck out. Right or wrong, that's exactly what happened. And we saw ammonia prices skyrocket. We saw natural gas prices skyrocket. And as a result of that, the inputs that we use to manufacture things like, oh, I don't know, nitrogen skyrocketed as a result of that. And that, that high price and people not wanting to contract and hold shit tons of inventory is what caused. Uh, uh, and, and then you also have to take into account that a lot of fertilizer plants weren't wanting to buy large reserves of natural gas and large reserves of, of ammonia to be able to produce these things. Then you have uh, 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 a shortened staff, short staff, right? Because you've got people that are dipping in and out in COVID with COVID. And so they're having to, instead of being able to run three shifts, they're down to two, then they're down to one, and then they're working four days a week, and then they're back to two, and then they're down to three days a week, and then they're back to three, and then they're down to three days a week. So this idea that we're running out of fertilizer is a fucking myth, part two, and something that has been proven false. And if he wants to say that, well, it's phosphorus, it, that's been proven false multiple, multiple times over and over again. So, so far, the first two points out of this guy's mouth is a complete and total fucking lie makes everything grow right so it's it's basically makes the food grow that we eat so that's not a very good situation to be in so what i'm here to tell you is there is a brand new discovery in the field of fertilizer and what i'm here to tell you about is what's called bio fertilizer that means bio means life fertilizer means life fertilizer it's fertilizer that comes from mother nature pause. all right today pause in did, fact did, we're did, not going back to this video anymore I can't fucking did, handle this guy. Did, Go ahead, Debe. Did Butch Jones invest in this fertilizer? Is that why it's <laughs> brick by brick? Life champions. All right. Life champions. So, uh, so let's just go through this website there because. Uh, Matt, go ahead and uh, the the premise of the video again is that uh, there are. <sighs> uh, there's this life fertilizer, this bio fertilizer, right? And of course. This guy has developed it, right? And he's selling it. And now you have this opportunity, this this wonderful opportunity, Ray, uh, to go on here and look at his website that's got the Chinese and Russian flags sitting right up there. All right, so here you go. What, what right there? The three secrets of synthetic fertilizer and pesticide industries not want you to know. Dr. Jeffrey J. West wants us to know. Uh, let's see here. Why is he doing this? Tell you my story. Only what? Oh, wait, reason why keep, he keep, keep, keep scrolling down. Integrative. Keep scrolling down, and I, and if you just want to search for the word petroleum, right? Uh, because he he starts off he starts off by saying, and one of the first things that comes out of here when he says, you know, uh, specifically your lawn and garden farm naturally and effectively, and he says all synthetic fertilizers come from China and Russia, right? He said, you see, these synthetic fertilizers are made from natural gas. Okay. Now, if you search for the word petroleum, you're going to see down here in secret number one, synthetic fertilizer and pesticides are made from petroleum. Now, guys, I'm just a dumb redneck from, from old country bumpkin, Tennessee, right? Is natural gas petroleum? <laughs> no, not, not, not in the least. Uh, 
I think old boy. So you mean to tell me that Dr. Jeff here can't even get right what the fuck the difference between petroleum and natural gas is? Nope. He can't get it right because because here's the thing is that here's one of these fucking fruitcakes that wants to sell you all of this uh, quote unquote organic plant derived bullshit. Okay? He's another one of these fruitcakes. And I remember talking with uh, Jay Pink about organic stuff, right? And I told Jay Pink, hey, Jay Pink, if you want, I know how to organically kill somebody, okay? <laughs> so uh, just because it's organic doesn't mean that doesn't mean that it's better. <laughs> yeah, is it arsenic on the uh, periodic table? Um, hey, J Pink, if you see right there at the bottom, it says Jeffrey J West, comma, and does that say MD after his name? Because he keeps colloquially referring to himself as a doctor. Is that an MD at the end of his name? No, no he's DC. a board for certified doctor of chiropractic, a.k.a. fake doctor. Go fuck yourself is what it says. Now, just to add insult to injury here, let's continue to scroll down where he's talking about his unbelievable realization of how he did this. In 2008, his life was heaven. He opened up a second clinic, did a triathlon, got married to the woman of his dream. She probably cucks him. Uh, and then came crashing down into four months of hell. He had a business divorce, and I'm sure his wife was probably sleeping with the guy. Uh, that wasn't too bad, but within three weeks of that happening, he had a stage four malignant melanoma. That is terrible, and I hate that for the guy. Uh, and then he goes on. He's worried. Is he going to make it to her 10th birthday? Well, four weeks later, uh, he's got cancer and a business divorce. He's traveling 65 miles an hour down the hill, uh, uh, rocking out to music and singing when a truck spun out in front of me. I locked up my brakes, pushed hard on the steering wheel, and felt my head pull away from my body, what seemed like six inches. My what? What was he driving? My Land Rover. Of course, the fucking doctor of chiropractic is driving a Land Rover because he's a uh, cuck. Uh, was bent. And what was bent? Axles. Now, gentlemen, again, I am poor white trash from fucking North Mississippi, Memphis, Tennessee. My wife and I, we got married. We lived in the hood in fucking Orange Mound. I am a zero on a scale of intelligence quotient. But I think axles is misspelled here. Am I am I am I on drugs or is that how to spell axles? No, that is that is a, a a severe misspelling. Okay. So you mean to tell me that Doctor Jeffrey J West here not only not only does he fuck up the rest of this, but he can't even spell the word fucking axles right? <laughs> Nope. Not a lot of good is going on for Dr. Jeff here. And maybe maybe it's the chemo that has his brain all squirrely, and I just need to give him a hard time. Because if we continue to go down here, we can see the contents of his fertilizer, and that is going to shed a shit ton of light on this, right? Because it contains tens and thousands, tens of thousands of probiotics, archaea, fungi, and it also contains jasmonic acid, amino acids, humic acid, and fulvic acid. By the way, jasmonic acid is a gas, if I recall correctly, or am I thinking of ethylene? Or is jasmonic acid a gas too? I can't recall. No, jasmonic acid is not a gas. And ethylene definitely. is a gas. Yeah, yeah. fuck that up. Uh, but... but <laughs> Uh, what we see here is that this is not a life-changing fertilizer by any stretch of means of the imagination. He does not list these ingredients on his label. I checked that out as well. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and so this is one of those, you know, uh, life fertilizer probiotic things where you don't have to list it on it because uh, even uh, 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 the AAFCA, uh, AFCO, AAFCO uh, fertilizer labeling laws do not apply here because it's literally nothing in the bag. Uh, so thank you, <laughs> Dr. Jeffrey J. West, sir. You can uh, can fuck right off. And uh, I hope I hope you never sell anything to anybody. And by the way, to the chiropractor that uh, 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 put the neck hold on that girl in Atlanta, Georgia and fucking killed her. Uh, you can go fuck yourself, too, because that's my opinion of fucking chiropractors right now. Yeah. Yeah. He was tweaking on her neck. 
and uh, uh, ground down a little hard. And uh, yeah, she died. Uh, so uh, rest in peace to that sweetheart. And uh, old boy does not give a shit right here whether or not you fucking die. As long as you shell out your $149.95 for a 17 ounce bag of shit, you're a fucking cock. So- Beep. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> All right. uh, In this same vein, though, but look, boys, I've got something coming up in our burns here where we're actually going to do a little bit of interesting work here on these microbes. Right. Because this guy's really, really uh, hard for microbes. Right. And so we've got some brand new research that's coming out that correlates microbes and soil health and all that to uh, yield data. And uh, but that's going to be coming up a little later. And uh, but, but fuck it. Let's check out this week's burns. Oh, man. I really don't like that guy. Do you think he'll come on Thirsty Thursday and I could just scream at him like that the whole time? Would that would that be <laughs> too inflammatory? I honestly don't care. I do not care. We'll buy I stopped caring. <laughs> He'd do it, too. Oh, shit. Probably would. Yeah, we'll, hey, we'll pay you 15 bucks for a cameo. He'd be like, oh, yeah, man. Sign me up. That sounds a great idea. Um, horrific news here. Uh, authorities have fa- have identified a 62 year old a 62 year old man who died after being pinned underneath a lawnmower. Uh, the North D- Dakota Ooh. Highway Patrol said Mark Saggard of Cav- uh, Cavalier was mowing the east ditch of 134th Avenue Northeast uh, when the mower began to slide as he maneuvered over to the top of a culvert opening. The lawnmower rolled over and he was pinned underneath. A coworker and uh, mm-hmm. and a few other people helped to move the mower off Saggart, who was taken by ambulance to First Care Hospital. And he was later transferred to Altrue Hospital on Grand Forks where he succumbed to his injuries. Rest in peace, Mark. I, I absolutely hate it for you. And uh, my God and your family and everyone else, may God have mercy on your soul. Oh, uh, in our gosh. next one here, uh, in more delightful news, uh, we have one who is dead after a lawnmower collides with a car. Mm. person driving a lawnmower was killed in a collision with a car Saturday afternoon in Clanton. Uh, according to Clinton police, he was attempting to cross the street. The subject failed to yield when a vehicle came crossing the street and the two collided. The driver of the car had minor injuries, but was not transported by ambulance. Names will not be released until the family is notified. Oh, so ugh. here we have a young person in Alabama, or just a person in Alabama hit by a mower and ultimately killed again. May God have mercy on your soul. That is a tragedy. But boys, I wanted to save the rest of this time for our... Uh, uh, soil microbe uh, biomass mm. activity composition and CO2 emissions in long-term organic and conventional farming systems. Soil use and management from Wiley Online uh, Library here. Uh, and we'll just we'll kind of read through the abstract here because this should give us some pretty good information. Uh, the implementation of environmentally friendly agricultural policies has increased the need to compare agricultural aspects of conventional noted as CON, in organic farming, noted as ORG systems. The objective of the present work was to compare the effects of an organic and conventional long-term experiment on bacterial and fungal biomass and activity, as well as soil CO2 emissions and readily available nitrogen forms in a, culti- in a soil cultivated with Helianthus annus. Uh, the microbial biomass was more active and abundant in organic as well as soil CO2 emissions. Did, did anybody hear that? The microbial biomass was more active and abundant in organic farming systems as well as soil CO2 emission. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, despite being less abundant, fungi were more active than bacteria in both organic and conventional experiments. Uh, uh, 16S RNA gene sequencing showed that the organic treatments had a significantly greater bacterial richness than uh, conventional. Uh, Cyanobacteria, uh, actinobacteria and proteobacteria were among the uh, the most abundant phyla, contributing uh, contributing more than others to the differences between the two systems. Moreover, the soil NH4 and NO2 content was not significantly different between organic or conventional. NO2, huh? Uh, while NO3 was less than the organic NO3. Organ- okay, ammonium. Uh, yeah, I train. Okay, okay. Uh, organic sunflower yield was significantly less. Compared with conventional, where sunflower yield was less, was less. Okay, while much remains to be discovered about the effects of these agricultural practices on uh, soil chemical properties, microbial diversity, our findings may contribute 
to this type of investigation. All right. Now, guys, we are in the state of social media right now. Dr. Jeffrey West here has blown his load all over the idea of uh, probiotics and bacteria and all that. We've got Doc, uh, how to with Doc, who is cramming Dirt Booster. And Dirt Booster version one sucked so much ass, it had to go into Dirt Booster version two to uh, to suck even more of your ass uh, right out of your <laughs> pocketbook via your asshole. That That is when you know someone hates your guts, when they'll stick their head so far up your ass and suck on it that they're attempting to empty empty your wallet that way. Like that is that is pure hate and disgust of uh, that human has for you. So um, be sure to check out Dirt Booster, uh, link in the description below. But anyway, <laughs> effectively what this study is showing is that, all right, organic systems, we're doing a great job of having these massive amounts of cyanobacteria, actinobacteria, proteobacteria, super healthy soils. But but what does that translate to? That means we are translating to significantly greater soil CO2 emissions, which isn't the whole fucking thing we're trying to combat now, right now, with 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 climate change and all this is reducing soil CO2. And that why we adopted less tillage was that we were escaping so much fucking CO2 loss to the atmosphere. Now, uh, and then the other piece of this is that, yeah, we've got healthy soils that are great and they're farting CO2. But the problem is, is that it's not contributing to any fucking yield difference. In fact, we have significantly less yield with it than we do when we have a, a, a conventional field that is not quite as uh, 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 bacterial or fungi healthy, quote unquote, than the organic field. But we can't. It's one. One is re- is releasing less CO two, has higher yields. The other is emitting greater amounts of CO two and has lower yields. Which one are you going to fucking go with? Which one is actually the beacon of health in that scenario? Am I losing okay. my mind, or is am no, I just not, so boomer that I can't figure this out? No, I'm I'm going to get even more boomer on you, Matt, because a long time ago, what my grandfather told me is, if you can't s- harvest it and sell it, you don't grow it. What a and novel that, concept! Okay, I mean because I could give the rats. But about growing more obscure microbes in soil, if at the end of the day, I don't have the crop yield to show for it, all right? If I haven't got the crop yield to show for it, why am I doing this? And no, Matt, this is alarming me a little in that the... Organic soils are emitting CO2, and in the meantime, all of the uh, environmental uh, collectivists are coming after our cars. They're coming after our electricity. They're coming after civilization, telling us we got to stop it all because we're emitting too much carbon dioxide. How does that all hang make on, sense, Ray? Right? Hang on, <laughs> boomer me this, Ray. Boomer me this. Uh, what about nitrogen dioxide? Isn't that the big thing we're hearing out of Canada and Europe right now? Is is nitrogen mm-hmm. dioxide? Mm-hmm. There's no statistical significant indifference of of soil NO2 emissions between organic and conventional systems. So why the fuck are we going to limit NO2 losses? By switching to some sort of uh, or- organic farming system, that that idea that we're going to be able to do nitrogen dioxide or nitric oxide, I don't know what the conversion is. Do you know what the conversion is of nitrogen dioxide to nitric oxide? Do you do you, do you know what that looks like? I don't. I don't. And and you know what? Here's the thing: is that logically, mathematically, maybe I'm thinking about this in a reductionist uh, viewpoint. Is wouldn't I want less land in agricultural production but that land be higher yielding overall wouldn't i want that overall like instead of a thousand acres on this uh happy organic uh, program instead i have maybe 400 acres or 300 acres 
and that damn land produces yield. I mean, which one? Which one would you rather have, Matt? Well, you Boomer. know, as a guy told me on Twitter, and this is a guy who graduated from Cambridge, Cambridge, as a matter of fact, he said we needed to stop analyzing uh, farms based on yield, and we need to start uh, 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 analyzing them and calculating. Uh, how valuable they are based on their efficiency in distributing nutrition to people uh, because yield is not the important metric there. So, again, more big brain activity from uh, from the universities there. I mean, that wait a minute, just, wait a minute. We're going to so redefine yield as a metric okay. of nutrient uh, uh, dissemination efficiency um, because the word yield is, is uh, 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 not okay, then, uh, equivalent to their ESG program. It's okay. in, in AKA it's a scam, right? Let's, yeah, let's it is just a scam. be honest. Yeah, it's a scam because all right, so what is this Cambridge educated uh, scholars definition of nutrient efficiency? Because I know for myself, I'd like to think that I'm rather nutrient efficient. Okay. No, no, no. They're talking about the nutrition as of people. Of people, of people, not not of, yeah. of of applied nutrients to plants, but the the amount of nutrition we're applying to people and the efficiency of getting it to them. So we're not worried about how much of, of, of crop yield we're getting. We're worried about how much nutrition we're actually applying to people. As yeah, as how much we're going to redefine uh, the metric of yield as as something else that okay. it's not, which is still highly dependent upon yield. Yeah, highly dependent on yield. So then, what? No. They've done studies of this as well. And at the end of the day now, Matt, what are the most efficient sources of protein for people? What oh, is the most efficient? So Beyond okay. meat. Wait, let me check Wrong. Beyond Meat stock real quick and I'll, I'll tell you. Wrong, Matt, because the most efficient sources of protein for people include Crickets. not even that. <laughs> red meat eggs and milk uh sorry plant-based people i mean you guys do a big fail because uh you know an elephant can survive on you know eating grass and palm fronds and whatever but I was watching this nice, uh, you know, video on YouTube the other night where a damned elephant, uh, yeah, he had to go make number two and what was coming out was the size of bowling balls. Okay, Matt, it was rather horrifying. It's like, and, but then what that means is that everything that Jumbo is eating is mostly passing through him undigested. And likewise with people, how much that we consume is passing through us undigested as well. Okay? And I'm going to ask that because I've known many people where the most malnourished and sickly people I know I see them force feeding themselves green material. Well, okay. The kale is going to save us all. Uh, Demay, <laughs> be our voice of reason here. Tell us we're <laughs> psychotic and uh, and that we've been we've MK ultraed ourselves or something. You know, we 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 they're putting acid Wait. in our in our water supply. In this segment or the one before? <laughs> <laughs> Either. I'm, I'm, I'm Either. perfectly okay. <laughs> we need to check Matt's whoop and see uh, see where he peaked out after the show. That, that's subscriber only content, member only content. But um, so uh, JP, go ahead and throw this first one up. Uh, this first thing I, I I found was interesting in the in the article there. Um, so this looks at the different um, species of uh, bacteria that they found in. Uh, the the soil samples, right, that they were looking at and trying to understand between the conventional and the organic programs, right, over the long term. And so what you'll see here is in this in this Venn diagram here, 
in the middle, there's 16,692 organisms that basically were in both the organic and the conventional uh, okay. soils. And then the difference is on the organic, uh, they had 453 uh, unique species within the organic program and 272 unique species within the conventional program. So that leaves us with a difference, right? So the uh, organic had 181 more in terms of raw numbers uh, species, which if you add all this up, accounts for 1.03% of all species with that were found and identified. Okay, okay. so mm. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. And to ask the, another question is, those that 1% of species that are different in the organic only program mm -hmm. what is their actual benefit to their presence yeah what is their uh, actual benefit uh, i mean what what are they so doing it, there <laughs> to go yeah. back to the cambridge to go back to the cambridge article or the cambridge uh, fellow there right Mm -hmm. Yield is not important, right? The raw number of what we get out of the soil is not necessarily important. It's how productive the organisms that are in there are. And so it's good that there is a genomics lab that's actually working on this, right? That understands how this is all kind of coming into play and everything like that. Because they're trying to, I think, I think they're trying to figure that out and, and uh, you know, stoke some further investigation and studies into this. So really what you see here is just scratching the surface. And I think... It's sort of, you know, if you go down to the bottom of the article, they talk about, you know, some of their conclusions and that they they sort of pine for, hey, we should go organic because, you know, it's better. And I'm not saying that it's not. I think there are cases where this absolutely can work, but not at scale. So and here's why I say that right right now in 2022. So when people watch this video, you know, 10 years from now and, you know, we're all locked up and they're like, oh, those guys, those guys are idiots. J Pink, go to that next graphic real quick. I'll be in and a padded, see this. padded room. <laughs> yeah. you, you, what size straight jacket do you wear again? Oh. oh 16 and a half by yeah. 44 in the sleeves. Do they have those in big and tall? Um, I, I, that's why, I, listen, I think everyone in the world will be happier if I'm on a boat in the middle of the ocean when no one can find me. I mean, then everyone wins in Probably. that scenario. <laughs> All right, so here's here's where we're looking at yield. So what they were growing was sunflowers, right? And in this case, right, pretty simple crop to grow, very easy to do studies on. And so if you're listening on audio format here, so uh, we have a uh, significant probability level, right, outside the, the standard deviation here on these particular uh, measurements and metrics, right? So overall yield, right? we have uh, a significant difference there. We have a significant difference on flower diameter, right, on the sunflowers. We also have a significant difference on number of seeds per flower, right, almost d over double, right, uh, on, the, on the mean here. And then uh, seeds, seed weight per flower, also more than double on the mean. And then the only thing that was not statistically significant was the overall plant height. So, okay. Again, Ryan. yield, diameter, number of seeds per flower, seed weight mm -hmm. per flower, all different. And what this means to say is that the conventional program outperformed the organic program at all of those key metrics, right? All those key yield metrics. Okay. So go ahead, Ray. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in looking at this, Ryan, what my question would be is in the organic program, was there an attempt to supply equivalent amounts of N, P, and K to the sunflowers? Was there even an, an attempt? Or, because you see, when, when looking at something like this, I always have to ask, were the nutrients necessary for maximum yield even being supplied? Or was this a case of, you know, Foo foo dust and unicorn pee, and don't worry about N P and K. <laughs> so in in this case again, they they went about it a little bit different way. There was not equal amounts, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And so they talk a lot about uh, mineralization rates and some other stuff here. And 
again, what they found is that while some of that nitrate uh, was equal or very close, right, as it was in the soil, the applications were different, and therefore uh, they had different yields, right, between these two programs. Mm-hmm. And so all that to say, you know, you, uh, again, I'm, I'm happy that they have started to go down this route and try to look at this, right, and look at it from a long-term perspective. A lot of times we see these on short two-year, three-year horizons. They get published, and then, hey, well, because we, you know, we did it in two different sites, or we replicated it over three years, we can publish it now, and that means it's going to work everywhere. And I think that's where we're at: is that there just has to be uh, a wider adoption of this to really understand what precisely is going on in these two different systems. And so, uh, a little too much editorial at the end of the conclusion for me on this one, you know, in terms of the article that they wrote, but. Hey, look at the data. Look at uh, you know what it's telling you. And again, nobody, none of us are up here saying that conventional farming or conventional agriculture needs to be bombing the shit out of stuff with N, P, and K. It's you know we're always trying to put out you know the least amount that we need to, but we still have you know only so much arable land. We've also got you know major things outside of our control that affect crops, right? Storms, okay. droughts, floods, all this other Matt, stuff, right, that you have to hedge against. And why would, you, why would you put yourself in a position to produce less on the less. same area, knowing that there's so much at risk and out of your control? That's my only question. Okay. Because my other, my other little thought on this as well is that the other component to this organic agriculture is increased need for labor you know increased need for labor i mean that's just uh part and parcel of an organic system is you're going to need a lot more labor because your land does not yield as much per acre and in addition to that increased labor i always go back to overall carbon in you know input or carbon footprint of any agronomic decision what is the overall carbon footprint of any decision and i'm looking at if the land doesn't yield as much that means that we're going to have to have more land in cultivation right and that's a greater carbon footprint but, uh, uh, but. <laughs> uh, but uh, but it's organic. Uh, gentlemen, let's check out this week's returns. Oh man! Uh, for the uh, for the patrons, I did actually throw up my heart rate uh, kind of response in the discord it it spiked twice <laughs> pretty, pretty decent about about you watch that. resting resting heart rate you know uh right. news nation network lauds rodney smith's free lawn care madison band who's teaching youth about generosity honor and the value of hard work caught the attention of national news network the morning in america segment on news nation network profile rodney smith jr of madison about his initiative raising men and women lawn care service smith founded the service as an ins- inspiring mission that bridges generations uh news nation's american hero profile spotted uh, spotlighted smith as an individual who brings kindness generosity and positivity to others in 2015 smith started the organization after he saw an elderly man struggling to smoke uh, to mow his lawn uh, Smith parked his car and uh, then finished mowing the, mon- the man's lawn for free. Smith realized that he found his purpose. And it goes on to give more information about this. For those of you that don't know about Rodney Smith, uh, several years ago, we did uh, we did kind of a, a no- notoriety and uh, uh, money raising deal for him. And actually, I think it was because of Ben the Lawn Guard. He was the one who uh, uh, turned it all uh, us all on to it. And, it. and it turned out just absolutely amazing. Uh, raising men and women lawn care uh, is he goes around and, and these kids sign up for the 50 yard challenge and they take care of, of, you know, they do 50, 50 cuts for people and, um, and it's, and they do it for free and they, and he does it to inspire them, to teach them to be selfless and uh, to, to serve others, to respect elders. And 
I, I mean, it's just an absolute amazing thing. If you are of the means, show some support and love to uh, to Rodney because this is the kind of person that is breeding the next generation of people that are not going to grow up and be like me. And uh, and we need to support that by all means necessary because uh, I just there there needs to be fewer of me in the world, and uh, and Rodney <laughs> Smith will will take care of that. Uh, also, I hate mowing grass too, so I, you know I need to I need to get off here. Uh, the Florida Turf Program celebrates centennial anniversary this year. University of uh, Florida Turf Grass Program turns 100 this year. We'll throw a party of sorts in October to mark the occasion. What is that party going to be like? I'd like to be there for that. Oh, man. Uh, to celebrate the centennial event, you have a whole little alumni golf tournament in the evening uh, reception marking the 100 years of the Turf Grass Program. Uh, the golf tournament, a fourth person scramble, is scheduled for noon at, at uh, Mark Bostick Golf Course in Gainesville, which is ranked number 24 on Golf Week's list, a list of best campus golf courses. Uh, the two-day bash will uh, conclude on October 5th with Turfgrass Field Day at the UF Research Center in Citra, 20 miles south of campus, where the university's faculty will provide updates on the latest research. Um, there is a lot of good research that comes out of UF, and uh, I can say that everybody that I have worked with that was a graduate of UF, is uh, they, they are not the kind of people that they're good people. Like, they, they give a shit. Reinschmidt, man. You know? Who? Ryan Schmidt. Exactly. Ryan Schmidt. I thought you said Ryan Smith. And I was like, is, it, is no, that no, Rodney no, Ryan Smith, Smith thing? Yeah. Brandon no, no, Ryan Schmidt, Schmidt, graduate of UF, totally gives a shit. I love the hell out of Brandon. Yeah. Uh, hey, listen, in an era when, uh, whether you the listeners know it or not, there are major turf programs closing around the country. There's a lack of students. It's gotten a lot better here in the last two or three years. Uh, but to have a program that's 100 years old and continues to grow and continues to prosper and they've got great faculty down there, kudos to them. Kudos to them. And uh, it's the only time uh, in recorded history that you'll ever hear Matt Martin say, go Gators. Uh, we are not going to go that far, as a matter of fact. I appreciate you, but uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> good good for UF. Uh, go UF, uh, but I'm, I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to say that. Uh, Intep rolls out new user-friendly interface. And uh, for anybody that has ever attempted to navigate the Intep, understands how much of a breath of fresh air this actually is. Uh, earlier this year, Chad Allen tweeted out a photograph that had been uh, as relatable as it was recognizable for any turf grass professional who dived into the deep end of the National Turf Grass Evaluation Program's data pool and searched the perfect turf grass cultivar. Allen's Twitter tableau, taken in the heart of uh, golf's offseason in Westville, Indiana, where Allen serves as superintendent of the club at Chatham Hills, uh, featured an open laptop, a screaming yellow highlighter, and a short stack of printed data tables. You really have to know what you're looking for. <laughs> I was in the process of looking at Intep data. Ownership is looking to build two or three golf courses in the next few years. So I was looking at bent grass results. It was organized chaos, what I was trying to do, flipping back and forth all the time. If you want to look at genetic color or how does it do with dollar spot, you're always flipping back and forth, making your own spreadsheets, trying to simplify what I wanted to get. Like I said, it was organized chaos. If only he had waited a couple of months. Intep quietly released its Turfgrass Trial Explorer version 1.0 earlier this month, along with it, a pro the promise of a kinder, gentler Intep experience. <laughs> there's just a lot there. Uh, uh, there's a lot of good stuff there, but I remember my classmates not really understanding it at all. It's a godsend if you can blame them. Uh, and, and, you know, there's shows some pictures here of the updated interface and, uh, uh, you know, where you can go in and, and download the Turfgrass databases, the Intep Turfgrass Trial Explorer V version 1.0 at intep.org. If you go to intep.org, you'll see it. And this website, I mean, let, let's, let's be honest. The Intep website looks like it is straight out of circa 99. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, this was like going from like, you know, web crawler or ask Jeeves like all the way up to freaking uh, what was the original Google. Microsoft what you see is what you get editor uh for um uh web websites I cannot remember what it was called. Uh, Microsoft had a what you see is what you get editor and I I do not remember what it is uh, Adobe had like Dreamscape or something and then there was a Microsoft one and and I I just cannot remember what it is but that's exactly how it looks like this thing was designed, including front the page, buttons. front page, Microsoft front page. front page. There you go. There you go. God, I showing my myself. age. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, 
It's a long a time ago, Matt. But sir, if you're no. if you're a millennial and you didn't play around with Microsoft front page, give me your millennial card back. You don't deserve it. Mm. But seriously, I mean, uh, <laughs> that, that's a that's a huge that's a huge win because being able to sort by multiple different categories, that's that's a really uh, I can't tell you how much of a huge thing that is because there is a shit ton of information in all those tables, but having to decipher it yourself. And even then, you, you still aren't sure. Like, you know, you got to go out and see it for yourself, but it's a great place to start. So for those of you looking for uh, your favorite cultivar or cultivars of uh, different species, check that out. It would be a good tool to have, play around with, and uh, get ready for seeding season, right? A lot of dead grass out there, I have a feeling, is on the, is on the horizon here, gentlemen. It's been hot. It's been dry in certain areas, and there's been a lot of people that think stress blend will pull the grass out of thin air back to green again. So with Thanks that, uh, we have no mailbag, so we're going to get out here. We're going to go hang out with our patrons and let them choose this week's episode title. I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Coming up on Thursday, Thursday, we have Preston with his half acre in Oklahoma. Oh, and, uh, boy. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to really set his head on fire, and I can't wait uh for that uh thank you everybody for tuning in and we'll catch you on the flip side